So early in my married life, I used to tease that there were two very practical benefits of marriage. Now, that was before the cell phone days. Uh, The first practical benefit was not having to remember phone numbers anymore or birthdays or anniversaries. It was just, hon, what's the phone number? The second was, I used to tease about, was having someone to blame for all my mistakes. Probably not as clever and funny as I thought at the time. Unfortunately, um, it was easy for both those things to get, become realities. One is I lost uh, my awareness sometimes of phone numbers. And second, I uh, had a bad habit of blaming my wife for my mistakes. Typically, there are some undercurrents that are in our hearts. And um, there is a difference uh, when we're living single and alone and when we're in relationship. Uh, Those relationships bring some of those undercurrents uh, to the surface. Oftentimes, those undercurrents uh, wonder about how, how a particular thing affects my comfort or threatens my preferences, or, or can't they change so that I'll be more comfortable around them, or, or even uh, can't they be less irritating so it would be easier to be around? Um, why can't they just simply admit I'm right and they're wrong and we can go ahead and move on? That type of stuff. There are two primary responses when we hit pressure points. One is to fight, to dig in, to argue, to seek, to win, to work from the posture of I I need to change this person. The second is to step away, a kind of flight, range from ignoring the issue to to bailing out or walking away. Whether we are in a physical family or a spiritual family, we are going to run into pressure points. Because those same type of choices, either uh, the fight or the flight, can bleed into our community, our relationships within the church as well. We'll be looking this morning back into Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 1 and 2 as the scriptures call believers to a specific type of response in pressure points in relationship. The rest of the the section we've been looking at, uh, we've been looking at uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. The other verses actually flow out of of these two verses, and it it explains why the result or the response is so important. We have been gleaning truths from Ephesians chapter 4 about life together. What does it mean to live in a community of believers, a local church of believers? And as we conclude this series, we're going to dive into uh, those two verses. But first, I want to make sure that we review some thoughts. So we just have, have the overall flow. It's a good review for those that have been here and for those who haven't, just to give you a taste of how we've been flowing as we've looked through this text. We started the first week with Ephesians 4.3, which is one of the specific calls to action. Verses 1, 2, and 3 are the verses that are specific calls to action. Verse 3 says, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And as we looked at that concept and what we need to reinforce is that God creates the unity. We are not called to produce it, we're called to preserve it, to maintain it to live out Christ in an appropriate way. The bond of peace it talks about uh, not just harmony with God, but harmony with one another, but even more, the shalom, the peace, the fullness of life that comes through God and God alone. It talks about the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Unity literally is oneness. It is one. It is being one together. Ephesians 2 talks about how God has taken the Jew and the Gentile, uh, just absolutely opposed groups, and put them together into a new entity, a new man. Other texts uh, explain that the division not only is erased between Jew and Gentile, but male and female, slave and free, so that we are all combined without those distinctions. It is a shared essence. You are part of me, I am part of you. And as we review it in the past, uh, because of that, your dignity is my dignity, your honor is my honor, my honor is your honor, your reputation is mine, my reputation is yours, we hold it together 
which is important to remind ourselves and keep in, 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 in thoughts as we choose to speak positively of one another because we are in essence speaking about ourselves. And we, it's great to be able to live in the confidence that others, that we can trust that others are doing the same. That unity confirms actually the truth of, of, of Jesus and his coming. That's out of John 15. It's a basis for reaching out to those around us who don't know Christ. But more than oneness, and this is the significant thing, is it's not just a oneness, but a new identity, a new bloodline. In Galatians 2.20, we have been crucified with Christ. No longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That is true of us as individuals. That is true of us as a corporate entity. We are a visual representation of Christ. That is our new identity. It's not this last name or this heritage or this vocation. It is we are Christ in an assembled body. That is what we are living out. We represent Christ as we represent each other. We worked through chapter 4, verses 12 through 16, and understood these important things, that unity and oneness can only be perfected in community. We can't do it on our own. We can't reach where we need to go by ourselves. Individuals cannot properly grow spiritually by themselves. We cannot reach spiritual maturity by playing solitaire. It requires the combination, the whole effort of the body. And that makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, as we talk about the body of Christ, uh, he's using the illustration of the physical body to represent the, the uh, spiritual body. And when you see somebody out uh, 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 doing a 50-yard dash, it may be their arm or their leg or their chest that gets through the finish line first. <laughs> but it doesn't go alone. It's connected to the legs and the feet and the torso and all. The, the body finishes together. It finishes together. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses, uh, on verse 14, it also tells us how important the body is to create a safety net spiritually. As we encourage one another, as we learn from one another, as we teach one another within the, within the local body, iron sharpens iron. We hone our understanding of God, of the Bible, and how to live out lives spiritually. And it helps protect each individual as well as the body as a whole from being driven by whim and by false teaching. Because we can see Christ lived out, we can see within the power and significance of the local church, credible lifestyles, testimony of God's presence and goodness. And the last item in the way of review is just to remind you of that synergy effect. Because God has called us into community, we are able to create an impact far greater than the sum of individual parts. Just like in our physical body, the result is, is a, a sum total, a, a ripple effect, much more effective than just the simple individual parts. God allows us to be part of something bigger, bigger than ourselves, an impact, a ripple that can change not only the Park Rapids area, but have influence in our state, in our nation, and worldwide for eternity. So those principles uh, the, uh, set the base of what it means for life together, that spiritual oneness. But it's interesting, uh, we're not going to talk about conflict today, but we are going to talk about the pressure points, those things where, um, where we're different. And these principles not only apply to marriage and other relationships in life, but, but they are part of how the body works together for the maturation of the whole. So let's uh, move towards uh, chapter four, verses one and two. As we do that, I just wanna make this clarification just from the flow of the text, just so you understand this. We have pulled application points out of, uh, out of verses four through 16. There are lots of application points, others that even more than we've pulled out that, that are available. <clears throat> 
But just so you know, verses 4 through 16, are, there's nothing in there that's a specific call to action. Those verses are descriptive. They let us know truths about the body of Christ, about the unity of the body of Christ, how the body of Christ functions together. They let us know about outcomes and benefits of being part of community, the body of Christ, the local church. They give us a lot of uh, information. They get the lion's share of attention. But sometimes we just fly by verses 1 and 2, which is a call to action. Two calls to action, verses 1 and 2 and verse 3. Verse 3 we've looked at, to diligently preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, it reads like this. As a prisoner of the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. So let's just digest those concepts a little bit. Walk worthy. Walk worthy of of the call by which you've been called. Don't live below who you are in Christ. Make sure your walk matches your talk. In fact, walk worthy, that, that word very literally um, it pictures an a old-fashioned scale. Do you remember those? We got kind of a bucket on each side. Years ago with release time, we, or with um, VBS, we used to do penny drives for, for the missionaries, boys against girls, and they'd have to try to weigh it out and even it out. Well, that's what the word entails, and the idea there is to balance the beam of the scales. So what we practice comes up to balance with what we proclaim, so that our walk matches our talk. That is what he's challenging them to do. That our practice uh, uh, equates with the level of our profession. The standard that we're called to is the high calling we have in Christ. And just if you were to read ahead, verses 17 and following, it's the same concept. Don't be involved. Uh, I tell you as the Lord, don't live as the, as the pagans do in, in the futility of life, the, the life you came from. But rather, verse 23 Uh, Be made new in the attitude of your minds and put on the new self created to be like God in the true righteousness and holiness. That is the standard. That is the privilege. That is the mark that we have the opportunity to pursue. And that's what he's uh, challenging the people to do. That calling in Christ uh, described throughout chapters 1, 2, and 3. Chapter 1, it talks about being blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies, that we've been raised, that we've been ascended, that we've been seated with Christ at the right hand of the Father. Chapter 2, that we are God's workmanship that he is already in advance prepared good works, that we have been created, that we have been handcrafted, built, to invest in eternal things and into other lives. Chapter 3, his power is at work within us. Those are the marks. Those are the pieces of who we are in Christ. That is the standard that we are to pursue. It's always good to remind ourselves of the promises of God and what and who we are in Christ. Sometimes we get discouraged and we just see the failures. But what we're called to look at is the righteousness of Christ that's been imputed and what privileges and honors he's given us and the, and the opportunity to live up to those great truths. So given that background, God uh, directs Paul to choose some very specific words to describe how, that, uh, how these believers are to live up to that calling. He uses the word humble, gentle, patient, and then the phrase bearing with one another. We're going to lock in on those terms for just a couple moments this morning. As we lock in on those, and I give you some descriptive of those, just if you would, listen for common themes. Just listen to how they intersect Let's start with humility. I'll give you definitions from various resources. 
uh, all biblical commentaries. Humility, defined by one writer as the quality of voluntary submission. The setting aside of one's comfort, preferences, or rights for the benefit of another. Holding others above self and selfish demands. Placing the needs of others ahead of our own demands. Serving rather than demanding others serve us. Those are all valid definitions of humility uh, contained in this word. In fact, if we were going to Ephesians, or Philippians chapter 2, humility is contrasted with the whole idea of self-seeking. Gentleness, the willingness to accommodate and graciously accept others. The willingness to meet people where they are at, regardless of their flaws and weaknesses. The willingness to meet people where they're at without requiring them to meet your preferences or demands. The choice not to talk down to others or demean them. Being free from malice and the desire for revenge in the face of offenses or being offended. Gentleness. Patience. We looked at that concept. We looked at the word when we were in the series Bold Love for just in the way of review. Patience, constraint exercised towards others. Self-restraint that does not retaliate it is used primarily with regard to relationships. The word is a compound word, one meaning long and distant and the other wrath, which means that it's slow in becoming angry. Having a staying power, a long-term lasting effect of not jumping into anger or wrath. Holding out, a long holding out of the mind before it gives room to action. Self-restraint in the face of provocation that does not hastily retaliate or punish. Choice not to become reactionary and controlled by the actions of others. A steadfast spirit which never get, gives in in spite of baiting, baiting from other people. One of the positive practical benefits of patience is its ability to break the action, reaction, counter reaction cycle. So, just a, a, a quick side note humility, gentleness, patience does not preclude taking the necessary actions that love compels. There are times they have to set boundaries, and, and they will set boundaries when and where appropriate. But these, these qualities refrain from revenge. They refrain from just pushing back or, or forcing somebody into the box that makes us most comfortable. Last concept, bearing with one another, it legitimately could be viewed as a summary statement. How to live out humility, gentleness, and patience is by bearing with one another, literally to bear or to hold up. To have tolerance until the provocation is passed. To put up with the faults and idiosyncrasies of others as they put up with our faults and idiosyncrasies. Remember that when we talked about the one and others? The mutuality, the reciprocal action? It's not sequential, it's not conditional. It means if they're nice to me, I'll be nice to them type of thing. No, to bear up with one another is as I act upon you, you act upon me. So if there's something that I find kind of irritating in you, I just need to remember that you're putting up with stuff that's irritating in me. There's the reciprocal action. That is the only way that community works because we are broken people in a broken world. God moves us and he's working to move us into Christ's likeness, but that process is, is a longer term play, and that process actually involves those irritations that we meet with other people. Did you catch the common themes, by the way? Humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with, did you catch the common themes? Let me give you another hint. I'll just read shorter definitions. Humility, quality of voluntary submission, setting aside one's comfort, preferences and rights for the benefit of the other. Gentleness, the willingness to accommodate and graciously accept others. Patience, constraint towards others, self-restraint in the face of provocation. Hear any common denominator? Yes. 
actions, preferences, opinions, idiosyncrasies of other people is not the driving force for our choices. Our choices are to be in a manner worthy of the call of, that we've been called, the call of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the level. That is where we're seeking to walk in a manner worthy of our calling, to practice our lives, uh, practice in our lives what we claim to believe through our profession of Christ. And it involves toleration and, and reaching out and accepting people that are different than ourselves. It's interesting uh, how these verses really drive the rest of this segment that we've been looking at. So we talked about diligently preserving the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. You cannot maintain peace. You cannot make sure that that moves forward without, um, without being able to yield to others and put up, putting up with things that you don't like doesn't make them wrong. It makes them different. Do you understand that? In verse 12, 11 and 12, it talks about a diversity of roles. And later in verses 15 and 16, it talks about how, how each part is unique and works together for the benefit of the whole. You can't have that without a patience, a gentleness, and a humility. Because if you don't have patience and gentleness and humility, what are you going to demand? That the other part operate exactly like you do. And that makes a non-functional body. Some, some churches strive for uniformity. The scriptures call us to a union, not a uniformity. We need diversity to grow and function. Uniformity is a false unity. It denies the reality of what God has created in, in his body, and that is differences, distinctions, different roles, and different responsibilities. We absolutely need others, by the way, to develop humility and gentleness and patience and bearing with. You can't do that in a cocoon. You just, you have to be meeting with people. You can hermit away and you don't have to worry about irritations in others. But when you move into community, all of a sudden you're amongst people that are different and you need to make a choice what you're going to do with that. A lot of times our first reaction is wanting the other person to change. And we become more concerned about controlling them and fixing them than we are about self-evaluation and the changes that God is inviting us to make. Does that make sense? Do we appreciate how arrogant that is? And how self-centered that is? I'm fine, they're wrong, they change, we're happy. That's not the way it works. And the warning bell should go off when we go down that path. Boy, if this person would change and this person would change, then everything would be right. There's the uh, flip side, the second reaction, that is to move away. And in those, our tendency is to blame others and avoid them or seek out, move out of those environments and try to move into a, uh, an environment where everything's same. The, the, the falseness of that is there is no environment where everything's the same. There are some environments where we convince ourselves that there's, that there's no differences, but there's always differences. And there's a purpose for that. When we start finding people that are more like us and moving away from others that are not. I don't know sometimes if we appreciate how damaging that is for not only the growth of the body of Christ, but how it stunts our, our individual growth as well. 
I mention that because that's part of what this text is talking about. There is no way you develop and apply humility, gentleness, patience, and bearing with one another by trying to force others to conform or to move away from them. God is inviting you and me to make some changes. When we fight, we tend to focus and obsess even over changing the other person. When we flee, we avoid growth. The better option is the here in this text. And the better option is to ask the question, what does God want to change in me? What does God want me to learn from this environment and this situation? Because of the text in, in Proverbs, and I quoted it just earlier, iron, just as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens the other. I learned more about myself getting married than I would have not being married. Does that make sense? A little chuckles out there. I learn more about myself if I'm paying attention in community than I would just hibernating away. But there has to be a certain attitude uh, to approach that, and that is to approach it as a learning instead of an irritating type of thing where I'm just irritated by others rather than asking God what he wants to work in my life. I want you to understand that doesn't mean that others don't need to grow. But it doesn't matter if, you're, if, if you think that others need to grow more than you do or not. The call here is to the high standard, to the calling that we're, to which we've been called, and that is to reflect Christ and to live out our profession in him. It's not to compare whether I'm, I think I'm 80% along and this person's 50%. And God uses those things there to develop us. I found these uh, couple things uh, to be true. That when I run and hide, God continues to pursue and invites. Ever hear the expression, out of the pan, into the fire? Sometimes you just, uh, yeah, I don't want to deal with this. So you move into another environment, and guess what? Yeah, there it is again. And you move into the other environment, and there it is again. And that should be a learning. That should be the bell should be going off and a learning invitation. I keep moving environments, and this continues to be the same. Maybe God's trying to tell us something. I make this, uh, this contention. There's, there's very few spouses, there's very few in marriage relationships that don't want their spouse to change. And actually, if you ask them and they're honest, they could come up with a really good list. Okay? That's true in friendships as well. But have you ever considered that God, and, 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 and sometimes, we, you know, there's a tendency to pray, oh God, pray, uh, change my spouse this way or this way or this way. And then you get frustrated that God doesn't answer that, even if the goals are noble. Sometimes we don't consider that perhaps God will never change our spouse until he completes in us what he wants to produce in us. You understand what I'm saying there? That maybe he will leave that unmolested until we learn what we need to learn and then things will change. I found this as well is that when I do change, when I discover what God wants to produce in me, or I respond at least to his invitation to live out that humility, that gentleness, that patience, that when I do that, a lot of those irritants and other issues become irrelevant. Isn't that interesting? That God has dislodged me from that selfish arrogant position and all of a sudden everything changes. It's kind of odd. We've been in this series on life together, living in community, to kind of come for a landing on the way you live in community 
is by making individual choices. But there's a lot of truth to that. Part of the idea of community is that we have to rub on each other. And we can rub on each other and get irritated and cause conflict and separation. Or we can look to God and say, how, how, how do you want me to change that I might glorify you? What do you want me to learn from the situation? If we are not doing that, the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace is very difficult to obtain. The corporate growth into maturity as we mature with each other in absolute necessity is hard to obtain. In fact, it's very hard to maintain good, good protection in the body from the waves and winds of doctrinal air if we're not allowing God to conform us to the image of his, uh, of his son through the ironing, sharpened iron within the body. So that would be the, um, the challenge. God is the one that invites. God is the one that empowers, by the way. Uh, the humility, the gentleness, the patience. You'll find those throughout the New Testament. You'll find uh, those concepts sprinkled in the fruit of the Spirit. You'll find those concepts sprinkled into a lot of the other epistles. But here he chooses those four. And I, I don't think it's by accident. He chooses four that talk about our attitude and our approach. As God invites, he will equip. He will give us the ability to live that out. But we make a choice as well. And that is the challenge for today. Let's pray together. Thank you, Father that uh, you do provide, that you do um, invite. And Father, we just, I just pray that you would humble us all. Um, to the place where we understand that we are not perfect and everybody else is wrong. That we have plenty of growth and that we're to bear one another's uh, uh, idiosyncrasies and weaknesses, that we have a long way to go individually and we can only get there corporately. Thank you that you are committed to bringing us into the conformity to your son, that we might walk in a manner worthy of the calling, the high, rich calling you have called us to. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>